Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm Nicolas Veron. It's my pleasure to introduce this session uh, of the financial statement series at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. And today, of course, we will talk about crypto. Um, this series has avoided the theme of crypto when it was uh, mostly about hype, but now we're having more diversity of perspectives, I guess. So uh, we're taking the plunge. It's also the last episode of the series for the year 2022, um, the third year of the financial statement series. So I want to give special thanks um, on this occasion to the teams that uh, actually make this series uh, live, and particularly the meetings department at the Peterson Institute, headed by Yvonne Priestley. Uh, warm thanks to Yvonne and to Sarah Chu and Jessica Parada, who are online now. Uh, and who are really the ones who make it all happen. Um, today, we I'm very grateful to our two speakers. Matthew Elderfield uh, studied uh, initially at Georgetown University in the US and then a master's in international relations and affairs at the University of Cambridge in England in 1988. He then worked at a number of industry associations in International Swaps and Derivatives Association, the London Investment Bankers Association, the British Bankers Association, if I'm correct. And then in um, 1999, joined the Financial Services Authority, uh, which uh, of course no longer exists, but uh, uh, brought together the prudential supervisory functions and the market uh, oversight in the UK uh, until around 2010. So he spent eight years at the FSA working on financial infrastructure supervision, markets, oversight, banking, prudential uh, supervision until 2007 when he became the chief executive officer of the Bermuda Monetary Authority, where he stayed two years and has been seen very much as a reformer uh, of that uh, financial center. In 2009, he joined the Central Bank of Ireland, actually was hired there, uh, I think, by uh, Pat Honohan, who is now at the Peterson Institute, uh, at the time of uh, uh, assistance program for Ireland and, uh, and cleanup of the banking sector. So that was uh, certainly um, a busy period until uh, for about four years, three, four years until October uh, 2013. And since then, he's been in the private sector, first at the Lloyds Banking Group in London as group director for conduct, compliance, and operational risk. And since 2016, uh, I guess first in uh, Stockholm and then in Helsinki at the Nordea as chief of, uh, compliance officer and then a chief risk officer uh, and member of the management board until March this year. So since March, Matthew has had uh, time to reflect on a number of issues, including crypto, which is why he's here today. Uh, and I should also mention that in September of this year, he has been appointed uh, by the European Central Bank, the ECB, in its capacity as banking supervisor, a familiar theme of the series, uh, as a member of an, an expert group, which will review the ECB's supervisory uh, review and uh, examination process, if I get the acronym right. Uh, Karen Petru has uh, studied at uh, Wellesley College, uh, also in the US, uh, then a master's at the University of California in Berkeley. She then uh, worked for eight years uh, for Bank of America, and then in 1985, uh, founded or co-founded Federal Financial Analytics, which is uh, a specialized research firm on uh, financial regulatory issues, which, uh, which she still leads. And she's a very frequently quoted voice on uh, nerdy debates on financial regulation, but also on broader issues of how uh, finance intersects with uh, with uh, uh, very broad terms in society. And I should mention the book she published last year, uh, titled "Engine of Inequality: The Fed and the Future of Work in America." So I get, I guess that gives a a sense of the uh, breadth uh, of uh, interest that uh, Karen uh, has expertise on. Um, and uh, she's also involved in several uh, nonprofit organizations. So many thanks uh, again to the two of you, and uh, over to you, Matthew. Thank you, Nicholas, and uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Pleasure also to share this uh, platform with Karen, who's such a respected commentator on the US uh, financial regulatory scene. So we have a provocative question before us, which is, uh, can regulation save Crypto. I don't think the slides are up there quite yet. There we go. 
Sorry, I made the, a small mistake, but it should be up now. Very good. And um, but let's start with a prior provocative question, if we can, on the next slide, which is: Should you let it burn? Should uh, crypto be regulated at all? But but let's be a little bit more precise in our question, since we're talking about financial regulation because crypto is effectively regulated for financial crime. The precise question is, should crypto assets and service providers be regulated as a distinct asset class, as a separate asset class, and not try to shoehorn them in as securities? And basically, we have an answer where in the EU, yes, they will be regulated as a big bang, as I'll explain. The UK is also planning to regulate crypto, perhaps a bit more Incrementally, as I'm sure Karen will give us insights, the US is still quite undecided. Why regulate crypto? Very briefly, to my mind, I agree, is this significant consumer harm and detriment that's taking place, and that the securities approach really hasn't worked. And there's also potential financial stability risks. So let's start with the EU and talk about MICA. So what is MICA? MICA is the Markets and Crypto Assets Regulation. Um, it'll be published in final form probably next month and then come in at the end of 23 or 24. And what MICA does, it creates a distinct asset class of crypto assets. So there's this broad definition, wide definition of a crypto asset, uh, which you can see on the screen and the slides will be available to read in detail, some exceptions. And then within that broad definition, there are some important subcategories. There's stable coins which they call in the directive asset reference tokens and e-money. They're subject to tougher regulation, particularly if they get above a certain size. And if they get too big, in the case of stable coins, there's a cap on them. But the bottom line is that the EU law is saying we have a distinct asset class called crypto and it's subject to regulation, not trying to shoehorn them into securities. So what is that regulation? We can see that on the next slide. And effectively, what MICA does is take very well-known concepts from existing market and conduct regulation and applies them across to this asset class. Again, the slide's available for you to look at at your leisure afterwards, but at the core is this concept of all crypto asset issuers have to publish a white paper. Pretty similar to the idea of issuers of securities having to publish a prospectus, which they have to stand behind and are liable for. There's some important exceptions in here. If you're just doing mining or you're doing so-called uh, airdrops and other things, you don't have to do a white paper. And there's grandfathering. So this only applies when the directive comes into place. Also, interestingly, for the crypto issuers themselves, they're not subject to supervision, just like an issuer of a security isn't subject to supervision, but they are subject to market oversight and enforcement actions. But those two subcategories, the ARTs, the stable coins, and the EMTs, they've got a lot tougher rules, no grandfathering, uh, prior approval, and they are subject to direct supervision. So that's the crypto assets. But as you'll see on the next slide, what I think is perhaps the bigger shock to the crypto markets is the fact that MICA also regulates effectively the exchanges, or what MICA calls the crypto asset service providers. And a crypto asset service provider is an entity that provides one or more, come back to that, of the, of the services listed there. You can see the list, but of like custody and administration, trading, exchange, crypto to crypto, crypto to fiat, that's quite important. There's some other detail for you to look at uh, in your own time, but I pause on that or more. That means that a single legal entity can bundle and do multiple activities together. That's an important concept that's been really problematic for FTX, as we've uh, heard about. There's no grandfathering here for uh, 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 having a, a license. You have to apply for that. Uh, and regulation will be by the national competent authorities and also by ESMA. So what does it mean? The point of this, uh, Matthew, sorry for interrupting, but national competent authorities mean basically market supervisors at the national level in every country. Correct. Yes, and exactly. like BaFin in Germany or uh, AMF in France, and Spot ESMA on. is the European Super uh, Securities and Market Authority in Paris, correct? Spot on, yes. And um, 
So if you're regulated, what benefit do you get and what standards for these the asset service providers? You see that on the next slide. And basically, you get a big benefit is you get the European passport. So what that means is if you're licensed by one country, by one of these authorities that uh, we just clarified, you get the ability to provide your services across the whole of the EU. So that's a big benefit, right? But there are standards and obligations, and there's a lot in there. But I'm highlighting two. There's a cluster, an important set around corporate structure and corporate governance. Got to have you know proper boards, systems and controls, capital requirements. But the middle one I've got on that list, I think, is super interesting, which is to say your corporate structure can't be too complex. The jurisdictions that you're involved with cannot prevent effective supervision. And this is a hark back, we we'll talk about it in the discussion, if you want, to the old BCCI failure and the BCCI directive, which is don't be too opaque and hard to supervise. This is going to be very challenging for the exchanges, as I'll mention in a second. The second big impact for them, I'd say, is tough requirements on client asset safekeeping, making sure that client assets are segregated uh, separately and imposing a liability on custody losses for the exchanges. And this is an area where there's been a lot of problems, as you'll see, where there have been crypto hacking losses up to three billion on year to date um, and uh, 2.1 billion last year, according to chain analysis. So I'll come back to the exchanges because that's very topical, but a quick word just to update you on what's happening in the UK. So uh, UK is also planning to regulate crypto as a separate asset class. Um, there's legislation progressing through parliament right now. It started at the beginning, just focused on stable coins, but just recently the government's tabled an amendment to put a broad definition of crypto assets and to say these should become regulated activities within the perimeter of regulation and also subject to the financial promotions regime in the UK. And that basically controls what advertising you can give and what risk warnings you have to have. And here the FCA's new high investment risk warning will in future therefore apply to crypto. I think it's a very powerful and clear risk warning you can see there. Details in the UK, not yet fully clear because there's a treasury consultation to flesh this out. Uh, that's gonna come out to actually within weeks probably. But let's double click on the exchanges because I think that's really where uh, Mike is going to bite and is very topical because of uh, FTX. I've given you the list of the top 10 exchanges. I flagged two things. One, the biggest one, Binance, is by far the biggest. It's five times larger than the second largest exchange. And you can see FTX is actually way down the list. Secondly, look at the jurisdictions. Look at the headquarters as best I could find them. Uh, a lot in the Seychelles, a lot in the offshore. And I think that is going to be a real challenge for the exchanges under MICA's rules about effective supervision and being transparent. The next, let's have a kind of speed view of the FTX problem. FTX's failure is creating 1 million creditors. So there's going to be some very small creditors in there as well. The claims are unknown as the size of the whole of failure at FTX. But we do know from bankruptcy filings that the 50 biggest unsecured creditors owned 3.1 billion. You can see a chart here of what the distribution, the biggest one is uh, 226 million. Uh, so these are probably crypto funds. But if you see on the next slide, there's an interesting disclosure in the uh, bankruptcy filings as to the location of where the FTX creditors are, the people who had their positions in the exchange, quite a lot in the offshore world as you'd expect for those crypto funds, but also interestingly say 8% of the FTX customers are from Great Britain. So there's certainly some small customers in the mix there as well. The key problem, one of the key problems, I'll get into the full list, is the structure of FTX being very complicated. Here is the org chart from FT Alphaville, which of course you can't read, but you get a sense of the complexity of it. You can go on Alphaville and see it. There's this very apposite quote from the CEO of CoinShares that basically says FTX isn't an exchange. It's basically a black box. And that probably applies to quite a lot of the other exchanges. So what were the kind of failings of FTX? I've given you a kind of list of those on the next slide. And my key point here is that the lessons from FTX 
need to inform the way that MICA and the European supervisors go about licensing the exchanges. So I'm not going to go through all the detail, but one big group is around structure and complexity and jurisdiction, um, vulnerability to hacking, but also crucially about client assets, the client asset problem, that what was supposed to be separate and segregated client assets were basically lent outside of the exchange into the trading arm or rehypothecated, and you had ineffective segregation of client assets. That is a big challenge. There's efforts by some of the current exchanges to do a better job of proof of reserves. We could talk about that later, but they really fall far short of what's needed. I think the question for supervisors stepping back is, what about the other exchanges? Do they have similar weaknesses? So I would say it's very hard to say from the outside, but the suspicion must be that others do have similar weaknesses. So the challenge is, how do you supervise a crypto exchange? There's this nice quote from Andrea and Ria from the SSM who expresses concern about how to engage with these entities. It's going to be a very big resource challenge for the national authorities to do this. They're under very tight deadlines for licensing. My key point is don't give the license to the exchanges until after they have made their improvements on their structure. And the key test case here, I think, is Binance. Binance is by far the largest exchange. It's already been licensed by the French authorities under MICA. Is it going to come up to full standards before it's relicensed in only 18, 12 months time? Also, what I think is really important here is strong European, UK, and maybe in due course, US rules in terms of client asset segregation to, to, to raise those to a sufficient standard to protect customers and to look at bundling of services in the same legal entity. A chance I can double click on that a bit later. So let me conclude by asking again the question, should crypto be regulated? Well, actually the debate is over in the EU and the UK. It is gonna be regulated. And therefore, effectively, I think that regulation legitimizes crypto as a distinct asset class. MICA is gonna have quite a shock to the crypto industry and require big improvements, especially to the crypto exchanges in terms of corporate structure and client asset protection. But let's be clear, to get effective consumer protection for regulated crypto is still going to depend on a few things, making sure those client asset rules are tough, making sure there's clear risk warnings to customers, making sure there's enforcement, and above all, making sure there's effective supervision. My worry is that you get this competition to be the crypto hub of Europe, and therefore that might impact the rigor of licensing. I hope that doesn't case, hope that doesn't happen, and I hope ESMA takes an active role in that. To me, the test case is Binance and that relicensing -li -re process. Will the uh, rigor of the licensing, licensing standards hold? So I'm looking forward to the discussion, looking forward to hearing what Karen has to say and getting people's views. Over to Karen. Thank you very much, Matthew. What a fascinating and important update on critical regulatory developments. Um, I wish I had some of those to, to provide for the US, but as I'll discuss in a very short period of time, the, the picture here seems to be almost always typical of the United States is chaotic. Uh, if I may correct Nicholas, the title of my book was actually Engine of Inequality, The Fed and the Future of Wealth in America. And it has a chapter on CBDC and crypto, because when we think about economic equality, crypto here is actually uh, important. You, we often think of crypto investors, traders, lenders, all of the, the folks active on all of the exchanges. Um, that Matthew has described as a group of youngish white men in hoodies. In fact, in the United States, you double the number of minority and lower income households have crypto assets than white and affluent households. Crypto assets have become an important source of hope for wealth accumulation for low income and minority households because in a period of ultra low interest rates, folks have become desperately seeking 
alternative routes to at least a bit of wealth accumulation and all of the advertising Super Bowl odds, the FTX arena in Miami, created an aura of legitimacy. And we will find, I think, in the FTX bankruptcy, um, there's supposedly a million creditors, but I think we will find many of them low and uh, moderate income households who have their life savings tied up and hope and quite likely lost as a result, not only of FTX, but I think of all the, the, the Luna, the other um, ongoing uh, uh, debacle in many of these retail focused crypto asset platforms. So first, at least in the US, we need to keep sight of the economic equality aspects of this, which is another bit of a fallout of more than a decade of ultra accommodative monetary policy, which made it absolutely impossible for lower income households to save for the future and turn them desperate for a source of wealth, which turned out to be crypto, which turned out to be a very bad idea. For, in our practice day in, day out, um, we've long found that when clients from other nations come in and they say, may I do X or should we do Y in the United States, what would the rules require? And our answer always has to be, it depends. You'll have state regulation, which is particularly important in crypto. For example, a state with almost no people and many more cows, Wyoming, is an important crypto hub, licensing institutions, several of which are seeking to become banks and have access to the Federal Reserve's payment system. One of the hypotheses about why FTX took what I would call stealth control of a tiny, tiny little bank in Eastern Washington state um, two years ago. And it seems to have had two purposes. One again, to gain access to the payment system. And secondly, perhaps to uh, handle all of the, I think likely to prove uh, what the SEC alleged this morning, criminal transactions between FTX and Alameda Trading. So you have all these complex points into the banking system due to state regulation, as well as very difficult challenges and rules like custody and who has custody of assets. Federal law is, of course, not intended for crypto assets. It is a traditional legal framework, which is one of the reasons why the SEC has, under Chairman Gensler, will continue to address crypto assets by uh, enforcement actions. To answer Matthew's question, in the US from a securities perspective, in particular regard to at least many exchanges, the Securities and Exchange Commission says we don't need new law, we don't need to regulate it, we need to enforce it. Back to my chaos point, because the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, which also regulates different exchanges, says no, 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 no. We want new law, we want to write new rules, and we want to be in charge of crypto exchanges, and also indeed the legislation they had drafted with considerable help from FTX that is now foundering in one of the Senate's committees as a result of, of all of this, would have given the CFTC authority over even consumer protection. The banking agencies at the federal level, the Federal Reserve, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and the Office of the Control of Currency have been largely standing by, telling banks on a case-by-case -case basis and in the Fed's case in one policy edict, if you do anything in crypto, be really, really careful which has led to considerable confusion as well as many banks not being really, really careful. Another aspect of FTX, which is I think going to be quite significant, and I've written a bit on this for the public that you can find on my friend's website, are the banks, a $150 billion bank named Silvergate, which had 90% of its deposits in crypto and is facing significant safety and soundness issues. Another bank, Provident, which has about 150 20 billion in assets, 58% uh, of its loans were to crypto miners. There will be fallout in the regulated banking system. That will lead first to enforcement actions and I think to a lot of new rules. I won't take the time, but I'm happy to answer questions about what Congress is doing today, tomorrow, and likely to do next year on both crypto and stable coin legislation and perhaps new law. But I think you will see in the near term, enforcement actions from the SEC, some enforcement actions from the Commodities Futures Trading Commission to show that it does too have teeth, 
and many steps by the banking agencies, some enforcement oriented and others new rules designed to wall banking off from crypto akin to the capital standards now pending in the Basel Accord, but likely to be tougher. So let me stop there with a speed update on a rapidly evolving, and as I said before, competitive, confusing, chaotic, um, and sometimes nonsensical US system for dealing with an issue such as crypto assets and trying to make the system safer. Sorry, I, after uh, so many years of this, I'm still unable to unmute at the right time. Thanks to both of you. Um, this was superb uh, and, um, and really uh, a very comprehensive. Uh, I have plenty of questions. We already have a few from the floor and actually uh, from the audience, I mean, and I expect more from the audience. We have very um, experienced uh, participants in the audience, so I, I encourage them to uh, engage. But let me start with a few more questions about the legislative and regulatory framework as it uh, currently takes shape. Uh, and maybe starting with you, Matthew. First, uh, can you uh, clarify, because I, I wasn't entirely clear about it, this issue of transition. So let's take the, the case of Binance. Is there a firm deadline for Binance to be uh, licensed or authorized or registered under MICA? And if that process doesn't happen uh, within the deadline that is in the legislation, then what happens? Does Binance uh, have to stop any activity in the EU? And I say Binance, but of course, that's because you highlighted it. Uh, but that applies to any um, uh, entity. Uh, can, you, can you just give us a bit more of a sense of how this issue of deadlines will play out? Yes. So um, the, uh, the final, final text of the directive is due to be published in the official journal of the uh, European uh, authorities um, in Q1 of next year, and then the uh, the effective date is between 12 and 18 months later. It'll be interesting to see what's decided. Maybe the European authorities will try to go a bit faster, but that basically sets the clock running on the licensing process. And, and if you get into the detail of the directive and into the regulation, there's very prescriptive timelines for the regulators to process a license application. They can stop the clock sometimes, ask more questions, but it puts them under a decent amount of uh, pressure, I would say. But there's a lot for the exchanges like Binance to do during that time, and there's no grandfathering. So just because the French authorities pre-MICA said Binance could get a license under French law, that doesn't apply to MICA. So what it means is like a year or 18 months for, and use Binance as the case because it's the biggest, they need to figure out where's their headquarters. They, they say they don't have a headquarters anywhere. You know, what is their corporate structure going to be? Which activities are going to be in which legal entities? What's going to be in the EU? What's the status of having a board of directors? What's the client asset uh, protection? All that needs to be sorted out in time for the French or other authorities to process that. If not, then it would be illegal and they'd be subject to enforcement action if they're providing crypto asset services into the EU. You mentioned the fact that the French have uh, granted a license, or if I'm uh, technically correct, a registration uh, to, um, to Binance under French law, not for all their activities, I guess. Um, how, how has this been? possible? How do you look at that uh, experience so far? Have you looked at it at all in any detail? I think it certainly raised quite a few eyebrows when it uh, took place. There's been some commentators that, you know, wondered how did the French authorities satisfy themselves uh, in order to do the authorization? I interestingly, the British authorities, the FCA, a year earlier published a supervisory notice, and I've given you the reference to this in the um, additional reading at the back that basically said, we don't think Binance is uh, able to be supervised effectively, that under the UK regulatory standard, uh, the information wasn't forthcoming, the uh, structure was too opaque, um, the jurisdictions involved were not satisfactory, and the FCA said, we're not going to supervise you. But within a year, the French authority said, yes, we will register you, um, uh, to use the technical term, and but exactly the criteria that were applied isn't clear to me. That's history now. The question is, there will be this relicensing, and MICA will set a high standard, and I hope 
that competition to be the next crypto hub doesn't lead to a weakening of standards, but that the supervisors, French or otherwise, are robust in applying all the requirements of MICA to the uh, prospective candidates to be crypto uh, asset service providers. And it just answers a question uh, asked by Charlene Biondi about Binance, uh, or if it doesn't answer it, then Charlene should uh, ask a follow-up question. Uh, I have a question for you, uh, Karen, and first let me apologize for not having oh. quoted the title of your book correctly. Indeed, it was the future of wealth in America, not work, but um, so sorry about this. Uh, Peter Pavlikovic uh, is asking about this commodity versus security debate, mm -hmm. and, uh, and specifically with how it plays out with respect to Ethereum and Bitcoin only. Um, so uh, can you take that one up? I, I can try. Again, it's, it's, it's complicated because I didn't discuss, it really depends in the United States on what your function is. To the extent Bitcoin is considered a currency or a, a medium of exchange or a storehouse of value, uh, then it, the same thing would be true with Ethereum or any other crypto coin, cryptocurrency. Uh, its regulation is most uncertain um, and principally at the state level, unless or until it gains access as they are seeking very desperately to do to the Federal um, Reserve's payment system. Uh, however, there's no regulatory construct attended to payment system access because the law has long presumed that the only entities with payment system access are banks, and therefore there's no reason for credit unions and no reason to regulate them. This is a completely confusing situation. To the extent an entity is an exchange, then it needs to be decided whether it is one that governs securities, as the SEC defines it pursuant to a particularly important Supreme Court case, or as the CFTC defines futures, which is its jurisdiction. Uh, and historically, the CFTC has defined it narrowly. Uh, it's seeking broader authority by both law and I think pushing some of its rules. Critical in the United States, in sharp contrast to other regulators um, of securities and futures markets, neither the SEC nor CFTC has prudential authority. For example, the SEC's legal charter is to mission, its mandate is to protect capital formation and ensure investor protection. So to the extent, for example, custody activities, uh, which fall under a whole different framework, uh, uh, pose safety and soundness problems, the SEC's ability to contain that is extremely uncertain. Again, the law there is anachronistic. Uh, can it impose capital requirements? Can it impose um, for in, in, a, in an exchange, for example, what are the rules that would govern the exchange? Um, they're, they're, they're designed for its equity and traditional bond markets. So we have all, and the S CFTC standards are even more uh, uncertain um, uh, because of the, its history in Agricultural related commodities, of course, now is, is covering derivatives to an extremely um, significant extent. But um, again, they're not like kind instruments. So it, there are all sorts of round pegs and square holes, as well as ambitions to contain and put one in the other that are going to take a great deal of time to work out. Matthew, how does that play out seen from Europe? I mean, uh, in MICA, we don't really have that debate of, you know, is it a security, is it a commodity? Maybe that's because uh, we don't have the turf war of SEC versus CFTC in the European context. But can you clarify a bit, making some transatlantic translation of this issue of uh, uh, securities versus community, commodities versus something else in the context of MICA and EU legislation? Yeah, I mean, I think what Mike has tried to do is cut through that, and and the question, you know, is like, are are purely spot um, crypto assets? What are they? And you've had this debate about should there be securities and try to shoehorn them into that. And different authorities have said, yeah, if it's got the characteristics of a security, and it's a very parallel debate to the one that Karen's been talking about. There's this famous so-called Howey test in the U.S. about what is a security. Um, basically, Mike has kind of like trumped all that and said, we're going to define a crypto asset and apply the regime to it.
But there's a bit of a parallel because if you have a derivative on a crypto asset, then financial regulation applies under the MIFID. So it's kind of somewhat analogous to what you've got there. But but I think what, what Karen's also flagging is that th there are these different regimes that are going to have to be reconciled and translated across. And, and it's pretty complicated because these crypto exchanges have this bundling, right? So like Karen, Karen drew about how like, you know, custody banks are regulated one way and exchanges are regulated a different way. MICA allows the uh, crypto asset service providers to do custody and trading and exchange in one place, which makes the risks of misuse of client assets higher and also makes the complexity of getting a, a differentiated regulatory approach much harder. And I think this is going to be an area where the European authority is going to have to look at this bundling and, and see how can you get the protections and the systems and controls to make sure that's not an unsafe thing for customer protection. So, Karen, um, you mentioned the fact that the SEC chair uh, Gensler um, has emphasized enforcement and basically said, well, we can enforce the existing regulation to protect savers and we deal with, um, with crypto that way. Um, if that's the case, uh, and I'm echoing a question from William Quinn here on, you know, whether regulators can be proactive uh, given the political economy uh, uh, resistance, I, is the fact that this, the SEC didn't act earlier on FTX, does that qualify as a supervisory or enforcement failure? That's a very important question and a hot topic. And while there is strong partisan debate, I didn't even go into really strong differences of opinion between Republicans and Democrats on the future of crypto regulation, how much of it is needed, and back to Matthew's question of is any needed, um, and if so, where? Uh, I just, as a parent, that would say, I think there's much more bipartisan agreement on stable points. And should there be a new law early in the new year in the United States, I would expect it to cover only stable points. But to go back to the SEC question, uh, Commissioner, as Chairman Gensler has been emphatic just a couple of days ago, saying it will be an enforcement only regime. And anyone in the crypto sphere, who wants to know the extent to which its activities pose the risk of enforcement should seek counsel from the SEC staff, which will issue either a no action letter or another opinion, providing that entity with guidance about what it may do without risk of enforcement. The industry has countered that, that while that may be true, it takes months and some years, and sometimes the answers are un unclear. And so both Republicans and Democrats have been pressuring Gensler to issue a body of trading and exchange related regulation. Um, he cannot be forced to do so absent new law. Um, and there's been some discussion on that, but he is very confident that he believes the agency, the commission can work best on an enforcement basis. And again, urges entities to pre-consult uh, to protect themselves. Um, you, you, so you that's had, a space to watch. Yes, Matthew. I was going to say you've had some limited enforcement action in Europe as well, and it's maybe useful to kind of conceptually split it between the enforcement action against the issuers of the tokens mm -hmm. versus the enforcement action against the um, exchanges themselves. So uh, you, you've seen where there's been scam tokens or um, uh, tokens that don't have any substance, then you tend to get enforcement actions based on fraud statutes or securities, but it's the exchanges that by and large have stayed out of this because I think the regulators haven't been willing to take them on, if you like, to say, no, you are a securities exchange, so you've got to come within the scope of regulation or we don't like what you're doing. That's obviously changing right now with FTX, with the charges filed today, and then we'll see that in the future where the exchanges will come fully inside the scope of regulation in Europe and will be subject to enforcement if they don't meet the MICA standards. So on the, yeah, I want to add that the, the changes in the US, the two cases, one, the, um, the US attorneys, um, uh, an imprisonment of Sam Bankman Freed in the Bahamas, and secondly, the SEC's actions are criminal actions. So they, that's, that's a level above the enforcement actions the commission has undertaken in the past, which were civil 
and we're largely focused on money. I think once there's the, uh, the handcuffs come out, the environment will change quite dramatically. And we've seen that uh, in a different space with Wirecard uh, as well, very much in the news right now. Yes. Um, so a different question to you, Matthew. Um, actually, bundling several questions. Charlene John is asking about the UK approach to regulating uh, multiple service providers. If you can um, uh, give us more on what can be expected from the financial services bill. And Christoph Bond is asking about Switzerland. Um, he uh, has the impression that Switzerland has decided not to regulate crypto. So is that uh, sustainable in a post-MICA world, given the relationship between Switzerland and the EU? And actually, I would encourage you to expand on other jurisdictions. If we think of Singapore, if we think of a number of other places. Um, so looking beyond the EU and the US, uh, what? how is the landscape shaping up? Yeah, so... Um... I think uh, that there's, in terms of MICA, they've actually borrowed some elements from the Japanese rules, if I recall correctly there, in terms of roughly the same definition, the idea for going the service uh, providers. So there's some similarity. And uh, Japan, if you remember, had uh, the largest crypto exchange that got hacked spectacularly a few years ago, and they strengthened their standards. You can see that uh, you know Korea and Singapore, a lot of other jurisdictions are raising their standards in response to what's going on here. It's interesting because MICA could set the kind of new standard. There's there's certain aspects of it that effectively are exported, um, maybe a bit like GDPR. Um, you know the fact that you've got this uh, uh, need to satisfy the regulator about your group structure. That, that I think effectively means that the licensing process, the regulators will look out beyond the European entities to see what's happening elsewhere, quality of the jurisdiction and the regulation. There's also rules about um, uh, um, uh, coins provided by third countries uh, based uh, um, uh, issuers, uh, which kind of export under certain circumstances the rules of MICA as well. For the UK, I'd say they're still not 100% sure how it's going to work. The Financial Service and Markets Bill is kind of new style British legislation that it provides a lot more scope for delegated acts and statutory instruments. So the, the, the Treasury has basically said, we're going to regulate stable coins. As I said, there's a recent amendment that now says, OK, we're going to regulate crypto assets as well. Bring them within the perimeter, put the financial promotions on them. Um, and that, and that service providers will be covered as well. But the detail really still is to be fleshed out. I think certainly the uh, service providers linked to stable coins will come under regulation of the Bank of England, PRA, FCA, the financial infrastructure team there. Um, but the detail of how it's going to work for the pure crypto assets, the tokens, is still to come. Is there going to be a white paper regime in the UK as well? What would the exemptions look like? What are the enforcement powers to be? Uh, the UK has promised a, uh, a consultation any day now. My guess is you're going to see convergence between Europe and the UK, but the devil will be in the detail. And there might be some arbitrage possibly going on between the UK and the EU, and also even within MICA. What's a stable coin? What's not a stable coin? So some of these boundary line questions on the perimeter are going to be quite important as the legislation is put into force. Are the other jurisdictions, say Singapore, you mentioned Japan? I think uh, I'm not as close to the, all those ones, but I think Singapore is uh, has been signaling a tougher approach on enforcement, um, likewise for Japan, and they have bespoke regimes uh, for crypto assets rather than a securities type uh, approach. And Switzerland? Uh, Switzerland, I don't I don't know what they're doing there. Okay. Um, to you, Karen, with a question from uh, Alice Tchernokova. Um, she mentions the fact that there have been many draft bills uh, in Congress. Uh, so can we expect a final framework to be a mix or separate pieces of legislation? And either way, when do you think that might come together? And maybe I will uh, add a point. You, you mentioned the partisanship, uh, maybe not so much on stable coins, but on other aspects of the agenda. So can you give us a sense of where the dividing lines uh, lie there and what are the kind of uh, uh, pet issues of Democrats versus Republicans uh, in the current or at least in the last Congress or the soon to be ended Congress uh, looking forward to the next one? 
Yes, I'm happy to do so. And, and as you said, Nicholas, we are rapidly counting down to the end of the 117th Congress. There were midterm elections in the US, I'm sure you're all familiar with, that elect the new Congress, both by re-electing every member of the House of Representatives and uh, a third of the Senate, and they will convene in January. Any legislation that has not been signed uh, into law in the prior Congress uh, uh, essentially disappears. Uh, it, it, it evaporates and the process starts all over from scratch. To the extent that an, an entity, an idea um, has been well developed prior to that adjournment and then essentially restart, it may advance more quickly, but you still have to go through all the procedural steps of hearings um, and uh, votes, markups, and had anything been approved by any of the committees, it would again be back to zero. Uh, as you all know, the House will now be controlled, albeit narrowly and fragilely and uncertainly by the Republicans. Uh, the new chairman of the House Financial Services Committee uh, is Patrick McHenry, he from North Carolina. Importantly, and this is a huge issue in both the House and Senate, securities and banking and insurance fall under the Financial Services Committee in the House and the Banking Committee in the Senate. Commodities falls under the Agriculture Committees in both houses of Congress because of the history of commodities as originally agriculture commodities. So there are bipartisan, there are partisan battles, there are jurisdictional battles. So you will see the banking committees fiercely fight the um, uh, actions in the ag committees that's already taken place in the Senate, not only because they strongly disagree with the light touch approach sought by FTX and the CFTC, but also because they want a little of an important issue outside their reach that bipartisan heads of those committees agree on jurisdiction. Uh, where they also agree, or now increasingly seem to agree, is on stable coins as a medium of exchange um, and the need for regulation in terms of particularly reserve assets. Uh, as Matthew mentioned, uh, the uh, promises about reserve assets have been principally illusory, and the ones that remain, I think, are, are somewhat dubious, more than a bit dubious, so the law would do that. It would create um, new standards on payment system access because of how critical that is. The Democrats want to see extensive investor and consumer protections. Republicans are much, much prefer a more light touch approach to that, and there will be fights over that. But stablecoin issues have been deemed the most immediately systemic by the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is the administration's voice for systemic risk, and the Treasury Department and the White House are pressing hard for that. Another bipartisan partisan divide will be the extent to which the US should have a CBDC. Uh, we don't have time to discuss that. It's clearly a huge issue. But to the extent the US needs a digital dollar, should it be only stable coins or should there be a Federal Reserve digital dollar? Democrats generally think yes, Republicans think hell no. And so we'll, we'll have a, a great deal of discussion on that as well. This is great. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, um, and you know, Matthew, a quick word on the EU on stable coin, just to say there's. Mike has got quite a tight approach there, I, I would say. It's one of those subcategories of crypto assets that I, that I mentioned. Interestingly, if you get above a certain size, the national regulator is no longer involved. It's the European Banking Authority becomes the supervisor. Um, there are tough um, uh, asset rules to get the backing there. But interestingly, what Micah says is if you get too big, we're going to cap you. Because if you get too big as a means of exchange, we don't want you to compete with our own currency in the single market or in the in terms of uh, the ECB. So there's actually a cap on the size. So I, I just wonder whether Mike is really going to constrain stable coins when it comes to the to the EU. And then for the UK, that's where the UK has uh, said most clearly what it wants to do is to reserve what it calls a digital um, settlement assets. AKA stable coins. So as Karen said, stable coins are quite high on the regulatory agenda, UK, EU, and in the States. Uh, maybe picking up on this, uh, one thing I'm curious about is the uh, prospect for direct supervision. So you mentioned 
uh, at the at the European level, sorry, uh, the the direct supervision by the European Banking Authority, which, uh, to my knowledge, is the first time the EBA will be a direct supervisor of anything in the EU framework. Uh, and I also I'm curious whether ESMA, the European Securities and Markets Authority, which is a separate EU level uh, uh, agency, uh, will have any direct uh, supervisory uh, authority on any of those segments, as it already has on other segments, and this is a moment when I have to disclose, as usual, that I'm uh, uh, an independent non-executive director of the trade repository arm of DTCC, which in the EU is supervised by ESMA. So, so how does that play out? And um, and and can you give us a sense of what that means for the, the European supervisory landscape going forward more generally? Yeah, I think it's quite an important change, actually, that um, for the uh, stablecoin issuers and for the e-money issuers, if you get above a certain size, it's no longer going to be the national authority of France or Germany or wherever or Ireland. It's going to go to the European Banking Authority um, to do the supervision. And then for the asset providers, um, what you have is a couple of things is that ESMA needs to maintain a register of all the asset providers. And if you become a significant um, uh, um, service provider, ESMA doesn't take over, but ESMA kind of looks over your shoulder quite closely and gets a very big role. I think this is a, a, a big change, certainly, as you say, for the EBA, it's the first time they've done direct uh, um, supervision. There's you know very competent people there, very professional, but it's going to be a, quite a shock to the system for them to get the right resources, the technical capabilities. Uh, it's going to involve them, you know, basically uh, setting fees on these creatures. Um, and then for ESMA, I think ESMA's got a, a really vital role. Like I say, I hope it steps up into this licensing process to make sure that the licensing is done in a rigorous way. Both the EBA and ESMA tend to be kept on a bit of a short lease by the Commission on its staffing uh, complement and how big their budgets are. And I really hope the Commission backs both of them with the proper resources because this is a big complicated task they're taking on. And if we've got time to talk about like client asset regulation, that is very technical and challenging and they're gonna to need to get more people with the right qualifications for that. That's very helpful. Um, let me move to very broad questions uh, asked, I think in a, <laughs> I, I take them as a, I've been asked in a, in a spirit of healthy skepticism about, about crypto. So we have questions from Steven Cecchetti, from Bernardo Correa Barradas, and from Herben Everts, uh, which I will bundle together because there are many common threads. So let me go through them. Steve asks, um, what the value can be of uh, um, uh, crypto assets except reserve-backed stable coins? Because he says, well, they have no value because they're not backed by anything, which is a long-standing debate about crypto, but also about fiat currencies, I guess. Uh, and then, um, so, so and, and Herben, asked a complementary question, which is what is exactly the role of auditors uh, given that feature of the crypto assets? What can they audit in terms of, you know, uh, items with no interest, no dividend, no cash flow? Um, so what is a, what, what is a, a proof uh, of uh, value or audit opinion in that, um, in that con uh, context? Or <laughs> he, he adds, or are auditors at the Seychelles? an extinct species. <laughs> species. Uh, so uh, we've seen the auditors of FTX, which were also, if I'm not mistaken, um, involved in some advocacy for the industry. Uh, so let's start with this and then I'll go to the other questions, but whether the value and the audit. Okay, so uh, if, if I can start, I mean, I think this is certainly a, a fair challenge that for many of these coins, it's hard to see there is intrinsic value. That doesn't mean that uh, investors can't lose money on them. And there's still a compelling case to have, you know, financial regulation for consumer protection. That said, I think there are, or you know, the concept of smart con uh, smart contracts, of um, you know, blockchain technology. There is a utility there. There's a practicality there. We see that in central bank uh, um, uh, um, digital currencies. Uh, you know, I think Gillian Tett's a very thoughtful commentator on this, and Gillian talks about the CBDCs, but also the settlement side for payment settlement and other types of settlement. So I can see potential there, but for others, you know, it's clear there's there's, there's no in, intrinsic value, and it's a speculative investment, but uh, still needs consumer protection, as I say. 
The auditors, now that is a, that is a key question. I think it really gets into this question about proof of reserves. So we see for FTX where they, you know, uh, had the customers putting their money in, uh, they, the customers thought the liabilities uh, had uh, ring-fenced assets to match them, but effectively those assets were lent into the trading arm and there wasn't the segregation and the protection there. And what you really need to do is make sure you're matching those liabilities to the assets, token by token, so it's not Bitcoin versus USD, you know, so you've got that and you're doing it at all the times and you do it in a rigorous way. And you're seeing quite a scramble now in the industry to say, how can we do our proof of reserves? There's some interesting ideas and developments out there, but the regulatory stand on this is quite tough. Remember back in 2008 in the financial crisis, Lehman's had a big problem on client assets. MF Global had a big problem on client assets and there was a big crackdown by the regulators. So there was some swinging fines from the FCA very tough rules put in place. And the idea to have a personal named responsibility. I remember when I was a compliance officer in one of my former banks, getting somebody to sign up to take that role, that was like the third rail. They didn't want to do that. It was super hard because you're calculating at all time your customer positions and you've got the assets to match them. What the regulators need to do is take this proof of reserves concept and build a regulatory standard around it. So you can match the assets and the liabilities and basically do it on a continuous basis. I can see the auditors stepping in, you know, once a quarter periodically, but the risk is it's window dressing around that point in time. So you're going to need tough rules. And this gets to the corporate governance. This gets to the structure. You need board members and compliance officers to challenge to make sure it's working at all the days in between the auditors are there. So auditors will be in the mix, but the regulators really need to come up with a client segregation rule that's very robust. Almost at the hour, and uh, there are so many more questions we, we could ask, but uh, that's where we are. So maybe um, starting with you, Karen, uh, also on Stephen and uh, Bernardo's questions, what's the future? Will crypto, now that we have this regulation coming, which we haven't had in the first years of crypto until now, uh, will crypto migrate to something beyond the scope of regulation? Because after all, as Stephen said, it's just code and databases. Uh, or uh, is it a mistake to regulate, which was kind of, you know, something we hear uh, from some uh, observers that it's so wild and will stay so wild that better not touch it at all. Uh, and uh, also a question from one anonymous uh, attendee, but which is um, too fun to uh, escape. Uh, what about NFTs? Uh, how do NFTs, non-fungible tokens, fit into that landscape? Uh, now we're again, almost at the hour. So if you can, can give us very brief pointer, pointers to this. I will, I'll be quite brief. I agree with Matthew that there are very good uses of some of the technology, particularly in the settlement arena. I refer you, for example, to something called JPM coin, which JP Morgan has developed for wholesale settlement. It's powerful, it works, and it's quite useful. Um, I, I long felt, as I said this in my book, you know, that most crypto assets are fake money. Um, that all fiat money, as you said, um, Nicholas, is, is a belief system. But because of the lack of controls, uh, this, it, it's all of the um, ways in which crypto assets can be quickly corrupted and then, of course, deceive the innocent, especially at a time of low rates. Uh, what I might expect to see is a, a stringent system of reserve assets that is also in the U.S. legislation, a new framework for stable coins, and they may well advance, but a lot more firewalls and barriers um, designed to limit the extent to which crypto has access into the broader financial system. Again, the payment system is a critical issue here custody, um, who's facilitating trading. And I think in the United States uh, in particular, there are going to be a lot more firewalls. And I have my strong doubts that crypto can survive in that, in that environment because it, there's mostly just nothing there. Thank you. Matthew, you have the last word. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't do that. Yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, whenever you create a new regulation and you set the perimeter, you create a boundary uh, and, and you have to be quite precise of what's in and what's out. 
And you see that in MICA, I'm sure, as the US rules and practices have evolved. So NFTs are mostly out unless each of the NFTs are in a series and they look exactly the same, then they're treated as a crypto asset. You've got uh, decentralized finance, if it's truly decentralized finance, is out. Uh, crypto lending is not a, a crypto asset service. And you've got these boundaries being what's exactly a stable coin and not. So you're going to have lots of lawyers having fun with that, advising their customers which side of the line to stay on, and regulators struggling to see whether it should evolve. And Mike has got a review clause in two years' time. So watch this space. The rules will evolve and probably expand over time. Thanks for the extraordinary wealth of insight and knowledge that you shared with us, both of you, Karen Petru and Matthew Elderfield. Uh, somebody asked a question to slides, uh, very good slides that Matthew presented will be on PIE.com later today. They're not yet, but this will come up very shortly. So there will be free access as the whole of the session in replay mode. Uh, again, many, many thanks. The next session of the series in the new year will be uh, on uh, January 11. We'll talk about hybrid war warfare and how Finland is preparing for scenarios of uh, hacking and other forms of uh, intrusion by Russia, uh, God forbid. Uh, this will be uh, introduced by Oli Rehn, the governor of the Bank of Finland. So mark that date, uh, January 11. And in the meantime, again, many thanks to our two speakers and happy holidays to all. Thanks very much for your engagement with the series. Thank you. Thank you.